sponsored by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. Good afternoon. I am Ann Holmes from the Library of Congress, and I am here today with Trung Lee Wen. Hello, Trung, and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. Hello, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. We're so happy to have you here. So we're here to talk about your new graphic novel, The Magic Fish, following your National Book Festival video on demand. To our audience, welcome. You can check out Trung Lee Wen's video on demand at loc.gov slash bookfest. Now it's time for you to ask our author your questions. We have up to 30 minutes today. I have a few questions to start us off, but it's really your time. So please start sending your questions and we'll go as long as we can to answer um, anything you might want to ask our author. So Trung, let's get started. Can you just start by telling us a bit about The Magic Fish, what it's about and what inspired you to create it? Sure, The Magic Fish is a graphic novel. It's about fairy tales and it's about stories. Um, it follows the story of a young boy named Tien um, and his mother, Helen, and uh, they have important things to share with one another, but there are cultural and linguistic differences that they need to overcome some way, and it's a story that's essentially about how to weather transitions and how to extend empathy to people um, when they're doing their very best without all of the tools that might be necessary to make everything go totally smoothly. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I, it was mostly made as, uh, <laughs> as an excuse to draw all of my favorite fairy tales, but as I was writing it and as I was drawing it, I became um, really enamored with the notion of all of the themes of um, transition and sacrifice in a lot of the fairy fairy stories that I had chosen for, for the book. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting. What were some of the, the fairy tales that inspired you? Sure. Um, it started with The Little Mermaid, because that's a story that had always been really important to me. That's something that I had always read as an immigrant narrative, and it also um, really resonated with me just as a queer author. Um, it's got a lot of themes from its um, from Hans Christian Andersen about kind of his own life and expressing feelings for people who would never be able to fully return them. And so it it was written a bit um, as a love letter to someone who didn't love him back. And so um, it resonates really strongly with me on a few levels. And so it started there. And then I realized that a lot of fairy stories about kind of moving from space to space and from um, kind of giving up the things that you have in front of you in order to attain something better, all of those things are really present in a lot of stories. And I kind of wanted to explore um, other stories that had echoes of that as well. And so I kind of went to, um, to the Cinderella stories. Um, I chose uh, an English German variant of a Cinderella story to tell at the very beginning um, called uh, Tattercoats. And then in the middle, I got an opportunity to tell the Vietnamese iteration of Cinderella um, and then kind of allowing those stories to kind of stand next to each other really uh, gives the reader the, an opportunity to compare and contrast and to make inferences about the priorities of the storytellers and each of the characters are telling the stories through their own visual vernacular, their own kind of visual imaginations are very present in the storytelling. Um, and so it gives you an opportunity to take a look at what is going on inside of the characters and what makes them who they are and why they imagine the worlds the ways that they do. Thank you. That's that's so that's so moving. I, I'm interested to hear more because this graphic novel is is so autobiographical. Um, what has its release meant to to your communities, to your family? Um, you know, that's actually something that I find really difficult to gauge, um, especially now while we're all sort of in lockdown um, because the pandemic is still ongoing. Um, so I don't know quite how to gauge uh, what a community response looks like. It seems um, very warm so far, but I'm also not someone who reads reviews of my own work. I like to let um, people have their own individual relationships to the work that might be different than mine. Um, but I have gotten a lot of really kind feedback and people sending me emails and sending me really nice notes about what the story meant to them. And I think that uh, that is a sort of a nice positive bellwether for its reception to me. 
um, is every once in a while I'll get a really kind of heartfelt message about the nature of the story and the ways in which it specifically resonated with certain readers. Um, it was one of those, uh, like, I, I kind of consider the story to be an opportunity to um, demand people's empathy. A lot of times when you're writing a story about immigrants, when you're writing about LGBTQ experiences, when you're writing about anything that sort of exists within the margins, there's this sort of special expectation that you have to edify the public about your experiences, but I really kind of just wanted to tell a story that centers the experiences of people who kind of live within those particular identities and tell them at eye level, tell them um, in ways that, uh, that would insist that these characters, these identities and these spaces are deserving a reader's empathy as opposed to simply their curiosity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for for that. That's that's really that's really powerful. Um, oh, so I see we do have we do have some audience questions here too. So from Ferdinand says, "Hi Trungles. In addition to Magic Fish, you've done some terrific work illustrating other people's creations. What were your favorites?" Um, I think my favorites uh are all kind of within the fairy tale vein. And so my first two short comics that I worked on were um, for Twisted Romance and for Fresh Romance. And so I got to work with Marguerite Bennett on Fresh Romance and uh, Alex DeCampi on Twisted Romance uh, for, um, I think it was Oni Press and then Image Comics. And those two are still very, very special to me because they started, um, like they were the first works that I did that kind of let me explore my collaborative voice. Um, and so those those were those were projects that I, I'm still very fond of to this day. Yeah, thank you. And Bruce asks, do you always draw to bring a story to life or have you ever illustrated something that you needed to create a story for? Um, yeah, I do things both ways. Uh, I I in the process of making the magic fish, what I've learned about myself is that as a long form narrative storyteller, I need to have a script written first. Um, so the magic fish actually did start out as disparate visual art projects. Um, they were all, I was just sort of drawing fairy tales that were, um, that were interesting to me and had things to say that I found to be very resonant personally. And so I had just all of these drawings floating around of different iterations of Cinderella. I'd done a bunch of mermaid drawings and I'd made a little zine of them. Um, and so those were things that were all kind of in the water for me already. And then I kind of brought those into the magic fish. Um, but when I sat down to actually tell a cohesive story and figure out the page compositions and how to elegantly convey all of the um, narrative beats and emotional beats of the story, I needed to organize things um, as a writer. So I, uh, I wound up figuring out that even though I'm someone who had always kind of considered themselves to be a visually oriented person. I need the organization of a text to work from for the most part, but I, I still like to do both. I, I like to just idly draw things. And then sometimes from there, a story will start to kind of come forth and bubble out. And once that starts to happen, I have to organize things a little bit and then I switch over to writing. But in general, I think I'm someone who needs to write something first, which is still a surprise to me. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, so what set you on the path to becoming an artist and a writer? <laughs> um, so it's, it's been a bit of an accident. Uh, when I was in college, I was studying studio art. I studied oil painting, which I which was the closest thing to my interest because I'm not someone who's very good with color to this day. I'm still um, a bit of a dilettante when it comes to color theory and that sort of thing. I don't know the textures and the ins and outs of painting that well. Um, but uh, the other thing that I studied was art history and I loved ephemera. I loved looking at the history of the printing press, advertisements from the turn of the century. I liked looking at golden age illustrators and the Gilded Age and all of the iconography that came about that time and what that said about publishing and about the gift book industry and about illustration and this the place of the designer and the illustrator 
um, within those industries. And from there, I, I, uh, I got interested in kind of dramaturgy a little bit. And so I got an internship at the Minnesota Historical Society in the summer of 2011, and I was so excited. And I was um, preparing to do a lot of research for their history players. I was assigned um, to research Harriet Bishop, the first school teacher in Minnesota. Um, and I got to look at all kinds of sewing samples and news clippings, and then there were budgetary disagreements between the major parties in Minnesota that summer, and so the government shut down. <laughs> and because I was non-essential personnel, I lost my internship, and it was a graduation requirement, and so I kind of oh, was no. scrambling to figure out what to do next. And so I wound up interning at the Minnesota Center for Book Arts, where I learned a bit of an appreciation for books, just like as something that is a physical object, that's a piece of art, that's something that people can hold and interact with. And I really loved that. And from there, I sort of started working on zines. And I didn't know if this had anything to do with what I wanted to do in my future. I had no designs to work in comics or in publishing or to make stories at all. But I, I'd always liked to draw and I liked visual communication. Um, and so I just started idly drawing comics and little stories and posting them on the internet. And I think um, I got the attention of some editors who then gave me some work and here I am, literally because the government shut down in 2011 <laughs> in my state. Yeah, I, I love those sort of accidental beginnings um and I, I feel like so many so many authors and artists have have stories like that which is just um which is so which is so compelling uh we have a question here from sienna who asks i think it's really cool how you use different colors for your different narratives how did you make this decision and choose the colors Sure. Um, so this was something that's a bit of an editorial consideration. This is something that I will credit to my editors, um, because when I pitched the story originally, I'm someone, like I said earlier, I studied oil painting, but I'm still not very experienced in using a lot of color. I'm not very confident in my color theory and the intention that I can bring to that aspect of storytelling. Um, and so I pitched The Magic Fish as a black and white comic, and my editors really wanted to take advantage of the full color printing that was available. And so um, we came up with a compromise. They said, hey, why don't you use a limited palette where you can convey values with um, one set of colors? And that can be a really elegant way to kind of um, to give you some baby steps into coloring your comics. And uh, one of them also suggested that it might be a really great way to um, convey which story universes um, each of those tales are told from. Um, and so it, was, it just became a really elegant way to convey to the reader um, what parts of the story they're accessing while they're reading it. Is it a fairy tale or does it take place in contemporary times within the context of the story or does it take place within a character's past and are we getting context for who the character is in the present later? Um, and so I, I ended up choosing three different color palettes. I chose um, sort of the kind of yellow ochre colors for the past because I tend to associate that with sepia tones, which gives it a nice vintage feel. And I think people conflate that with old things and things from the past as well. And so I thought that was a nice way to get people to think about it. Um, and it's also kind of a, a morning color. It's sort of a, a sunshiny color. Uh, the reds are sort of very present minded. It's sort of a midday color for me. And so that um, that became what the contemporary segments of the comic book became. And then the, the blues are sort of like a mysterious bedtime story midnight color. It's the color of what I think of when I, I think of um, telling bedtime stories. And I'd always loved the um, kind of fairy tale illustrations of Maxfield Parrish. And he used this incredible blue color, I think that's still referred to as Parrish blue. Um, and that has always been um, kind of associated with fairy tales in my mind. And that's that's the decision-making process that went into, the, went into those specific colors. But it was originally an invention of a compromise that came from my editors who did a really brilliant job of working with my particular limitations when I said, hey, like these are things that I'm not great at. Yeah, that, that, that's so fascin fascinating. And But I love how you talk about that sort of mix of, of senses of, of what things sort of you know make make you feel because that that seems important to to also convey to your readers and and maybe you know young adult readers especially so we have a question from 
Billy, who says, I'm really excited to read The Magic Fish. Do you plan on doing more in the fairy tale genre or doing new interpretations of other classic stories? Um, yes, uh, I am working on my second graphic novel now. Um, it's less set within a fairy tale universe, but it's based on a fairy tale that's been a favorite of mine. Um, and since my editor hasn't seen the whole story yet, I'm not going to um, flesh out too much about what it is, um, but it's kind of in the vein of a Beauty and the Beast fairy tale, and it's set in modern times, and I'm really excited to tell it. Um, I mostly shifted gears um, in that direction for this project because the magic fish ended up being much more emotionally heavy than I realized it was going to be while I was making it. And so after I finished that book, I said to myself that I needed to take a little bit of a break and I'm going to tell a light and fluffy story next. And so that's what I'm doing. But I, I'm excited to tell a lot more fairy stories within this kind of storytelling format. I, I don't, um, I don't often see a lot of fairy tales that are told within a comic book format. And, um, and a lot of the stories that are told end up being pastiches or remixes that I, uh, that don't always resonate with me. So I'm, I'm definitely going to tell more fairy tale stories within graphic novels and comics. Well, that's, that's really exciting. Um, we'll definitely look, look forward to your, to your next work. So, um, Trung, what advice do you have for budding young writers or, or painters or, or graphic novelists? Okay, ooh, this is very broad and I don't know hmm, that I have an easy response, um, but I'll do my best. Uh, so The Magic Fish is the very first work of fiction that I have ever written. Um, I've, the only things that I've ever written before The Magic Fish were essays for school, so book reports and like, I don't know, just long essays. So uh, The Magic Fish actually kind of is structured a little bit like an essay, and so that was kind of where I learned <laughs> that when you're creating a project that you want to feel really confident in, it's sometimes really helpful to play to your strengths. Um, because it was my very first long form narrative project at all, I had to let go of a sense of preciousness. You can't, um, you can't feel compelled to get it right the first time because that's going to stop you from growing and you can't grow unless you make a lot of mistakes and try a lot of things that don't work. Um, and sometimes the things that don't work in the present can be saved for later and they'll work within a different context. So I think the most important thing when you're a creator who's excited about doing things is to not really worry about messing up and doing things incorrectly because you will because you are who you are in the moment that you make your work and later on you're going to be someone who's been enriched by a foundation that you've laid for yourself you're going to evolve and you're going to grow but you can't evolve and grow unless you you know set that foundation unless you make a lot of fun and um you know potentially embarrassing mistakes in the beginning because those growing pains are something that will lend your work a lot more texture and a lot more intention in the future. So don't be afraid to mess up is the short answer. Um, and then I think the other important thing is that uh, I'm figuring out that everybody's relationship to a, a work is going to be different. As a writer, my relationship to the work in front of me is going to be different than a reader's relationship to it, than a critic's relationship to it. And so for the most part, if someone, you know, if it doesn't resonate with a, with a reader, then that reader has a wonderful just a wealth of other stories that they can pursue and consume. Um, your work doesn't have to be for everyone, everybody. It doesn't mean that you're doing it wrong. It just means that you haven't found exactly the right audience for it yet. But once you make something from your heart, eventually people will find it who, um, who will discover that the story resonates and those will be your people. So you don't have to be for everyone, I guess, is the other piece of advice that I, I got that was, I wound up being very useful. Yeah, that's really that's really lovely and and kind and and generous advice. Um, I'm sure our our budding artists um, really appreciate that. So Laura asks, how have libraries influenced you and your career? Mm, yes. Um, libraries are the most autobiographical portion of the story. All of the all of the details of the magic fish um, kind of come from bits 
bits and pieces of my life where I've sort of um, spun them into a different direction or sort of asked myself a kind of a what if scenario, but libraries um, are the part of the story that comes uh, at its core completely unchanged within the narrative for me because I am like the protagonist in that I spent a ton of time in libraries when I was a kid. Um, my parents also learned the Eng English language alongside their kids and so going to the library and picking out stories and getting to know each other and getting to know each other's priorities and aesthetic preferences and the ways that you know the language rolls off of each other's tongues, how we like to say things, phrases that stick in our minds, going to the library was such a huge huge portion of that stage of development in my life and I find it like I'm, I'm very sentimental about the library because of it because I spent a lot of time there and it was such a wonderful positive growing experience for me it provided an, an environment where I felt safe to be curious about absolutely anything that I wanted and I grew as an artist and as a person from it and it helped facilitate my relationships with my family members that way as well so so the library has has always been important to me and I think <laughs> I'm trying really hard not to um, not to make the library a, a huge thing in every single thing that I make, but I'm I'm still noticing that in everything that I do, I always want to shout out libraries a little bit. Well, of course, you know we we appreciate that, and we're all um, big library lovers and and nerds as well. <laughs> so <laughs> let's see. So uh, Sienna asks. Uh, she says, "I just have to ask." What is the story behind Trungles? Do you consider Trungles a nickname or alter ego? Um, you know, uh, my relationship to that handle has changed over the years. Uh, Trungles actually came from when I was in high school, I think. Um, I was really shy and I got a really terrible grade on a, a speech assignment that I had when I was a freshman. And so I joined the speech team um, in order to get over that fear and just sort of throw myself into the deep end of the pool. And I started to do really well and my confidence grew. And then one day I won something and the announcer announced my name. And because my name is uh, Trung Ling Nguyen um, and the L.E., uh, is my middle name. It's just the two letters. Uh, they, they squished my first name and my middle name together into Trungle. And <laughs> I remember being slightly embarrassed, but also not hating the sound of it. And so I just, uh, I, I sort of reappropriated that name and made it mine. Um, and so I've, it's never been like a nickname. It's not something that people who know me call me, but I, I know that people on the internet refer to me as Trungles. And I, I sort of, I sort of like that. It's sort of a signifier that, oh, like, you know me professionally from spaces that I, you know, don't, don't tend to interact with in person. Um, and that's sort of a nice, way for me to interface with people and give me context for who people are. So I, I feel very warmly about it. Um, I do answer to it if people um, call me Trungles. It's not something I ask people to do, but I certainly don't mind it. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think, I still think it's a cute um, handle. <laughs> <laughs> so you see it as sort of a, a term of endear endearment from your, from your fan base. <laughs> That's great. So Meredith asks, you have written about coming of age stories. What fantasy worlds influenced you growing up? Oh, I, I sort of grew up reading a lot of stories before the YA genre became where coming of age stories started to really be a thing. Um, so I read, I guess, what would be considered a lot of middle grade fantasy works when I was younger. So the Pradane Chronicles by Lloyd Alexander were kind of a big influence on how I thought about the world because it was really great. It was sort of a quiet adventure where it was still, um, it was still harrowing and it was still very exciting. But I think the lessons that Lloyd Alexander imparts in his Pradane Chronicles books are more along the lines of how to extend enough empathy to be a good leader, which is not something that you get in a lot of like adventure fantasies. And I loved that um, so much about those books. Um, I did read all of the Chronicles of Narnia growing up as well. I went to parochial school for almost my entire life. And so the Chronicles of Narnia and Christian Apologia are things that I'm pretty familiar with. And so I like to interface with those narratives still. Um, and I, uh, I have a special place in my heart for um, the, uh, uh, oh gosh, uh, Garth Nix's books. 
because I loved um, Sabriel when I was growing up, and I probably read them when I was a little bit too young for them, but I um, <laughs> had no problem absorbing them, and I still, to this day, consider them to be some of the most formative bits of storytelling. It's about, it's it's essentially about necromantic witches, like, <laughs> and that's not something that I... Uh, uh, that's not really my vibe most of the time. I don't do horror very much, but it was such a compelling adventure story. And I read it when I was pretty young. So I, I love those books to this day. I love that. Um, so we're coming to the end of our time, unfortunately. So um, just want to ask one more question for you. Um, what What would you say is if there's if there's a main takeaway from the magic fish, what would you what would you like your readers to to take away from your story? Sure. Um, this is always a little tricky for me to answer because i'm I'm a big believer in everyone having very individual relationships with the pieces of work that they consume. So whatever a reader happens to take out of it is going to be a take that I'm going to accept because it's not really my business what their relationship with that text is. But I will say that the closest thing to um, a sentiment or a lesson that I want to impart with the magic fish is that uh, oftentimes, even when people are trying their best, they might not have all of the tools and they might not have all of the right words in order to convey the intention and the care behind the things that they're trying to accomplish. So um, the lesson is that people are at where they're at and sometimes it's not going to be exactly what it is that you need in the moment, but it is worth something that, you know, people are doing their best anyway, in spite of not having all of those tools, in spite of not having all of the exactly correct words. Um, allowing people to try and grow alongside you is, is something that can be very difficult and it requires a lot of compassion um, to get to a space where you sort of understand that on an ongoing basis. So that's kind of something that I wanted to impart with the magic fish. That's, that's beautiful. And that's, and that's a great, a great way for us to end today. So Trong, thank you for taking the time today to, to talk to your readers. We've, we've had such a, a lovely time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for all these really wonderful questions. They were so thoughtful, and I, I deeply appreciate um, everyone who's able to make it out and ask me some questions. Yes, and yes, thanks again to our wonderful audience with all of your, your great questions. So you've been listening to Trung Li Wen talk about the magic fish. Thank you again, Trung, for being a part of the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. It's been a pleasure. And once again, to our audience, please continue to enjoy the book festival at loc.gov slash bookfest. Thank you.